So let's jump into it. Today is week two, our second week in a four-week series that we're calling Mind Reset. We kicked off this series last week. And in this series, we are wanting to take an in-depth look into your mind and into your thought life. Some of y'all, it's a very, very dark thought, right? But, but this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to take a look into our thinking. And I don't know about you, but there are times in my life I feel like my mind and my thoughts are all over the place. I don't know if you resonate with that, but sometimes my thinking is just a little bit off and I'm not thinking clearly and I just kind of maybe start to believe I'm losing my mind. This is the beginning season and beginning stages of losing your mind. That's what I felt at times. And I just find that I need a mind reset. I just need to press the reset button on my mind. And what we found, at least in church flow, is a great time to press the reset button is at the beginning of the year and at the beginning of the new school year. Those are the two great times. That's how we strategically place our 21 days of prayer and fasting in January and our 21 days of prayer in August. And so uh, this is a great time. Maybe you feel like I need a reset. This is for you. You've had a busy summer. You've traveled a lot. You've been to the pool and the lake. You've had no schedule, no disciplines for your kids. They're just running around crazy. And now it's time to go back to school and press the reset. We need some structure in our life. But because of that, in the pace of summer, maybe you just don't necessarily feel like yourself. You feel like your thoughts are things you probably should not be thinking about. And you might feel like you're just going a little bit, a little bit crazy. It's time to press the reset button on your mind. Maybe you can resonate with this. Maybe you feel like you've been getting the spinning wheel of death. <laughs> now just stare deeply into this. No, don't do that. That's really weird and creepy, but actually you can take it off. That's freaking me out. But um, maybe you just feel like your life is, is you're getting that, that just uh, like some, something's alerting you, telling you it's time for a reboot. It's time for a reset. There's something that's wrong. There's something that's off. We need a Reset, And in this series, we're hoping to help you to do that. Last week, we talked about helping you to win the battle in your mind, that there is a battle. Some of you feel that. There's a battle going on in your mind. And, and last week, we talked about how to win the battle in your mind. And today, I want to talk about how to take your mind back. It's time to get your mind right. My coaches would always say that if you've played sports, get your mind right. You're about to go play, get your mind right. Get your mind right. It's time to get our minds right. The theme verse for today is found in the book of Romans, Romans 12.2. It says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you do nothing to better your life, then your life will be pulled in the direction of culture, and you will find that your life will begin to look like everyone else's. But if you take the necessary steps and you, be, you begin to better your life, you'll be pulled towards God and your life will begin to look like a godly life. So, so the question is, how do we stop the pull towards culture, towards everyone else? And I believe it's through transformation. God is wanting all of us to be transformed into who he's called and created us to be. So how do we become transformed? We do this by winning our minds back. We do this by renewing our minds. We do this by changing the way that you think. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, there have been many times in my life that I've made some very irrational decisions. Does anyone resonate with that? You've made some irrational decisions. Times in my life, I just wasn't thinking clearly. I thought I knew what I was doing, but turns out it was a very irrational decision. I remember when my wife, Allie, and I got married the very first thing that we did as a new married couple, we signed a one-year lease on an apartment. Good decision. One-year lease, right? <laughs> Life was good. We were happy. But over that year, I began to become unhappy at where I was working, at the church I was working at. And, and I, I wanted a, something new. I wanted a change. I knew something was going to happen. I honestly was not that happy in my job during that one-year season. But at the end of that one-year season of a lease, my wife and I had that first time home buyer bite. You know, we just wanted our own place. We wanted our own home. And so what do you do? Remember, I wasn't too happy at my job and I knew things were not going the direction I wanted to go. So instead of listening to the season of life I was in, 
we went and did a very irrational thing and bought our first home. Now, sure enough, six months into living in that brand new home, I left that church staff. I joined another church staff. And now, instead of having a five-minute commute to work in Fort Worth, Texas, I was hired on at a Frisco campus, which you know Dallas at all. That's clearly across the Metroplex. And I had a one-and-a-half-hour drive each way to work. I did this for six months, and the, the plus side of that is I, uh, I got the Bible on audio, and I listened to the whole Bible. That's a good thing if you're commuting to do, but we sold our house after li- living in it for one year, one year. Really good, really good decision, right, realtors in the house, right? That's a really good decision to make. Now, I knew a change was coming, but I bought a house instead. Very irrational decision. Maybe you resonate with that. Maybe you've made some irrational decisions over the years. Tap your spouse and remember all the irrational decisions. Maybe. No, not you, just us. All right, that's cool. Whatever. Now, now for the question, why do we make these irrational decisions? Maybe for you, you want to save some money, but instead of saving money, you find yourself spending money. (laughs) For you, you want to spend more time with your family, but instead of spending time with your family, you end up working more. Maybe for you, you want to trust God with something, but instead you find yourself worrying and fearful and stressed out, and you decide to take control rather than surrendering control to God. Why is it that when we want one thing, instead we tend to settle for something else? Why is it that at times our minds are all over the place, and we become very capable of making some very very irrational decisions. Today, I want to help you by answering that question and help you see why you do the things you do and hopefully help you in preventing you from making some irrational decisions. If you're taking message notes, this is the title of the message. Come on, church, get your mind right. I'm your coach. Get your mind right. Get your mind right. Here we go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. Would you speak to us in Jesus' name? Amen. I've always considered myself handy. Anyone out there handy, able to fix things? Come on, church. How many are handy? Handy, okay? Let me say it another way. Maybe, maybe you're not handy. You just refuse to hire a professional. Anyone else? There you go. More hands. More hands. That's what I'm talking about. We may not be handy, but we refuse to pay someone to do what I probably will struggle to do, you know? I learned how to be handy from my dad. My dad watches every week, and he'll, he'll know this. But I, I remember uh, growing up, I'd always watch him fix things. And, and I don't think he necessarily wanted to do it. He just didn't want to pay someone to do it. And so he learned to fix a lot of things around the house. And a, as I got older and entered my adult life and owned homes, and I'd call my dad over to fix things. Because how many of you know, dad will always fix things, right? For me, that was the case. And so I called my dad all the time. And you see, my dad and I had something going on. We, we still do. It's kind of, it's a, it's a father-son thing. He, here's what we like. We like to fix things twice. It's kind of our thing. Like, <laughs> It's just like, it's, it's cute, you know, it's just a father-son bond we have. We just like to fix things twice, you know. It's totally for fun. Uh, it's kind of our thing. What we do is uh, we like to do things wrong the first time, uh, and then the second time we do it the right way. It's just, it's just, it's just how we, we roll. My dad and I have probably installed like 30 ceiling fans over, over my uh, home owning a housing career here, and uh, never once did we install that ceiling fan the right way. Never once. Even on ceiling fan 30, still got it wrong. <laughs> what you do is you, because it's tricky, you wire these things up, and you're like holding things and meshing things together and twisting wires, and then you come down, you flip the switch, and it doesn't work, right? And you realize you got to take it all apart and figure out what happened. And always what takes place is we learn that we wired it the wrong way. We wired it the wrong way. I remember one time we were replacing a, a, a chandelier in one of my houses. We, we, had, we bought this used home and uh, the people before us had awful taste and uh, had this very expensive uh, but ugly chandelier in the uh, stairwell. 
And my dad and I, we threw ladders up, and this thing was heavy, and we're replacing it, and I mean, we're sweating and bleeding, and it's just like we're having an experience, right? And like we, we like, we turn the breaker off, we taped it all off, like we're, you know, we're doing it the right way, you know, we come down after hours, like we finally get this thing done, turn the breaker on, and we go to flip the switch, sparks in fireworks starts to erupt in the chandelier, the thing started a fire, it started a fire. We ended up discovering that we crossed the wires. We wired it the wrong way, which caused a big problem. When wires are crossed, a problem is had. Maybe you feel like you might be wired the wrong way. Maybe you might feel like you have had some wires crossed over your time of life. And because wires have been crossed, there are some problems in your life. Maybe you see the problems, you wonder why you're experiencing the problems you're experiencing. It's because there's been some wires crossed at one point in your life. Last week, we talked about our brains. We talked about how our brains are made up of billions of neural pathways. Your experiences, your thoughts, your habits, they all create pathways inside your brain. It's like these trails all throughout your brain. The more we think a thought the stronger that pathway in that thought becomes. You know, we create these thoughts even at a young age, even when we're first born. We're creating neural pathways your entire life. Let me give you some examples. Mom tickles baby and makes baby laugh. Pathway is created in baby that says, tickling makes me laugh. Maybe you still like to be tickled. I don't know. But there's a, there's a pathway that's in there. Here's another one. Baby touches hot stove. See, we're still fighting up in here. Baby touches hot stove and gets burned. Pathway is created inside baby that says, do not touch hot things, right? Here's a good one. Baby wants candy. Mom says no. Baby cries. Mom gives baby candy anyways, right? <laughs> Pathway is created inside baby that says, when I don't get what I want, I cry about it, and eventually I'll get what I want, right? That's how pathways are created. We're doing a great job, parents. This is how pathways are created. Every thought that you have creates a neural pathway inside your brain. And as we learned last week, every time we rethink a thought, that pathway becomes more defined and more clear. And after a while, after rethinking the same thought, that thought becomes our dominant thought, and it becomes our belief. Even if it wasn't your belief to begin with, you've rethought it so many times, it's now what you believe. And just like that, a pathway is, is created inside our brains. It's just like if you took a, a hike in the woods and there's a pathway that keeps getting trampled upon, keeps getting traveled upon. That pathway becomes the dominant pathway. That's the same way that it works inside our brains. So this is good news and bad news. The good news is if you have some positive thoughts, some good, healthy, godly thoughts, well, it becomes easier to think those good, healthy, positive thoughts the more you think them but it's also bad news. If you have some negative thoughts, some ungodly thoughts, some impure thoughts, unhealthy thoughts, the more you think those negative thoughts, the more that becomes your predominant way of thinking and overall will become your belief structure. So why do we respond irrationally? Why do we behave so poorly at times? It's because wires have been crossed along the way and now it's time to take back our minds. Now it's time to uncross the pathways, uncross the wires, to take back our minds and train the way that we think. We need to retrain our minds. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but we train our bodies, we also should train our minds. Just like you train your bodies, th there, there is, there is uh, something we can learn from how we train our bodies in the way that we train our minds. Think about how you train your body. Now, when you were younger, you thought that all you had to do to train your body was work out, right? Exercise, run, lift weights, sit-ups, push-ups, do the whole nine, and then you hit 30. <laughs> and you realize it's not about what you do to your body. It's more importantly about what you put into your body, right? Right? And some of you guys, it doesn't affect you, and I don't know what you did to please God to give you a body of a God. I don't know. 
But for us, most of us, we have to train, we have to work out. It's more important than what you put into your body. The mind's the same way. What you put into your mind is important. Remember from last week, the life that you have, your life is headed in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life, the direction you're going is because of the way that you're thinking. So what thoughts are you feeding your mind? What are you pouring into your mind? It's time to get your mind right. And to help us get our mind right today, I want to look at the Apostle Paul. Last week we talked about how we will study his life throughout this series because it's pretty amazing. He had an unhealthy way of thinking. He was torturing and murdering Christians, and God got a hold of him. God transformed his life. And then now we see him as this amazing godly man with amazing godly thoughts. What happened there? So today I want to look at the book of Philippians in chapter 4. And just to give you context for this verse, Philippians 4, Paul was writing this from a prison cell awaiting his execution. I don't know what your thought life would be like, where your mind would be at, knowing that you are going to die for a cause that you believe in. And this is what Paul said. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. That phrase has something I've, is something I've been thinking about all week. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. There's some good things. Fix your thoughts. I think it's time for some of us to fix our thoughts. So what do you fix them on? He did not say to fix them on your problems, your stress, your fears, your, your worries. He said, no, fix your thoughts on what is good. Think about this. You only need to fix that which is broken. So if you have some broken thoughts today, it's time to get them fixed. The New King James Version, instead of using this terminology, fix your thoughts, uses this word, meditate, on what is good. Meditate. Meditate, what is that? What's med- <coughs> Gosh. I apologize. These cats, man. I'm so allergic. What's, what's, med- <laughs> what's meditation? <laughs> meditation is to focus one's thoughts. Now, when you hear that word meditation, you might be thinking like, like yoga, Eastern meditation, but that's not what we're talking about. Eastern meditation is emptying one's thoughts. Christian meditation is not emptying one's thoughts, but filling one's thoughts with the word of God. So, so, so Paul's instructing us to meditate, to fill yourself with the word of God. And when we fix our thinking, we do so by meditating and focusing on the truth of God's word. Instead of allowing our thinking to control us, we take our thoughts captive. We focus them on what we want our thoughts to be focused on. I just feel like it's time for us to get control of our thoughts again. To allow our thoughts to think what we tell them to think, not what they tell us to to think and behave. We focus on the truth. We will not focus on the lies. We're, we're focusing our thoughts. We're going to focus on what's pure. We're not going to keep focused on what's impure. We're going to focus on love. We're going to stop being enamored by hate. It's time to get our mind right and to fix our thoughts because I'm not going to let my thoughts control me anymore. Here's how that verse ends. Think about Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Have you ever noticed? Think about this thought. Have you ever noticed that unchecked thoughts generally don't lead to something that is true? Think about this. Left unchecked, your mind generally drifts towards worst case scenarios. Fears. Lies from Satan. And what Satan begins to do is build strongholds inside our mind. So we got to challenge our thoughts. Because if you don't challenge your thoughts, your thoughts will always lead you to the worst case scenario. I want to help you take your mind back. I want to help you get your mind right. And to help you, I want to teach you how to focus your thoughts. How to focus your thoughts on what is true and what is good. So here's three ways, three points today. I'm going to give you three ways to get your mind right. Here's the first thing. Identify the lie that is holding you back. Remember last week, the Bible calls these lies stronghold. These lies, these strongholds are lies that Satan is feeding you 
through negative thinking and in doing so, building a stronghold inside your mind. So here's the instruction from this verse we're about to read that we're supposed to do with strongholds. We read it last week, and here's what it is, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Here's what we're supposed to do with these lies. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, before we can demolish the strongholds in our life and the lies that Satan's been feeding us, we first need to identify the strongholds. Another way to say it is this. What are the lies that you have been believing that have led you to think that you are wired incorrectly? Maybe you've had that thought. There's something off. There's something wrong. What are the lies that you've been believing that led you to think that? Maybe for you, you would say, you know, my dad has a short fuse. I got a short fuse. My kids got short fuses. We're just angry people. We're Irish, you know. It's just how it's going to be. Or maybe you would say you've tried for years to overcome an addiction. You've tried everything. You've given it to God. You've had people pray over you. You got the book. You got the self-help podcast. You went to counseling and you still struggle. I guess I will always struggle with this sin and addiction. Or maybe you might say that I've tried to be close to God, but then something always happens. I get attacked and we just drift away. I guess I'll never have a good relationship with God. I don't know what your lie is that you've been believing today, but I think you owe it to yourself to figure it out. What is the pathway that he continually leads you down that is negative and destructive? What are the thoughts that he's using to control you and control your thought life? Another way to say it is what is the one thing that is holding you back from a relationship with God? I think that's where we're after. We want to have peace in our relationship with God. What is the one thing that is preventing you from having that? You see, we cannot fix what we're unwilling to identify. So if you're not where you're at or where you want to be with God today, you owe it to yourself to figure out what is standing in the way of a thriving relationship with you and God. Why settle for this when you know God has something better for you? You see, Paul, too, had to identify the lies that Satan was using to control him with. You see, Paul was a Roman citizen who was on his way to becoming a rabbi, just as Jesus But he saw Jesus as a threat to Judaism. And he was believing this lie from Satan that Jesus was a threat. So Satan used Paul, then Saul, to try to to demolish the Christian church and in turn take care of Jesus. Now, his name was Saul before he was converted. So Acts 8.3 kind of gives us one of his agendas. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. He was, he was being fed these lies from Satan. And Satan used him to hinder the gospel. He used him to hurt and kill Christians. But then God got a hold of him. You see, I want to look at this story today. He was on the road to Damascus. God got Saul's attention by blinding him which is ironic because he blinded him in the physical, but blinded him in the physical, opened his eyes in the spiritual. Saul Saul could actually see Jesus in the spiritual, even though he is blind in the physical. I'm going to read you an account today. We'll study it today. Acts 9, starting verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him, look at this, for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that If he found any there who belonged to the way, that was the church, the movement of Jesus, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He was so connected, he went to the government and asked them for tracking devices, for papers on the church so he could could prosecute them. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The the lie is being confronted right now. Who are you, Lord? Which is funny because he didn't introduce himself. He knew it. Are Are you God? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. There's the truth. You're not persecuting. You're not persecuting these people who are, you're trying to better 
You're trying to better this Judaism movement. You're trying to better God. No, you're persecuting me. I'm the son of God. It was in that moment that the stronghold that Satan had built up in Paul's life was destroyed. Jesus demolished the stronghold in, in, in Saul. You see, the lie that Saul was believing was that he was doing good things to, to, to progress this Judaism movement. He was doing good things for God, when in reality, he was persecuting God and God's people. Jesus helped him to see the truth. But here's what I want you to see. He later acknowledges Satan as the one who was lying to him. And this is what I want you, I want you to catch this, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Paul is now saying this about Satan. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. As an angel of light. A lot of times Satan will convince you of something that's good when in reality it's really evil. Satan had convinced him of what he was doing was good and right and noble and when in reality Satan was just deceiving Paul. Jesus helped to identify the lie and in turn he showed Saul the truth. So the first thing we got to do, we have to identify the truth, identify the lie that is holding us back. Here's point number two, we got to identify the truth that will push us forward. There is something that Satan is using to hold you back. You're being held back today by a lie of Satan, and God wants to step in, reveal the truth to you that will propel you forward. I want to get practical on this point. Now you've identified the lie. Hopefully you've thought about it. You need to identify the truth, and that's not it. Once you've identified the truth, you write down the truth, you think about the truth, you confess the truth until you believe the truth. So think about this. You write it, you think it, you confess it, until you believe it. You write it, you think it, you confess it until you believe it. We're replacing the lie of Satan with the truth of God's word. So we're gonna identify the truth, the, the lie. What is Satan lying to us about? We're gonna replace it with the truth of God and then we're gonna write it down, we're gonna think about it, we're gonna confess it until we believe it. And as we do that, we continue to do it, we are creating these new neural pathways inside our brain. We're gonna do it over and over and over until we actually believe it. Let me get practical. Let me show you some examples of what this might look like in your life. Here's the lie that Satan has built in you. Here's the stronghold he's established in your mind. God has forgotten about me. Maybe you felt that before. What I have done in each of these, I'm gonna give you several examples. I just went to the word of God and created my own truth for, to combat that lie. Here's this one. Here's the truth. God loves me unconditionally. He is working all things for my good. He has a purpose for my life. He will never leave me nor forsake me. You write it, you think it, you confess it until you believe it. Here's another lie. I'll never be enough. Here's the truth. I'm chosen and I'm set apart by God. He calls me his special possession. I am blessed and anointed to fulfill his plan for my life. His power is made perfect in my weakness. Where I am weak, he is strong. I just took scriptures, y'all. This is, this is just the word of God in action. Then you write it down. You think it. You confess it until you believe it. Here's another lie. I'll always be stuck in sin. Here's the truth. Sin has no power over me. Jesus died to set me free from my sin. His grace is sufficient for me. I have an overcomer and a new creation in Christ Jesus. You write it down. You think it. You confess it until you believe it. Here's another one. I'll always be sick. I'm always going to sneeze up on stage. It's just how allergies. I'm declaring I am the healed of the Lord. By his wounds, I am healed. Healing is the children's bread. He restores my soul. He strengthens me. He sustains me. He is near to the broken hearted. You write it. You think it. You confess it and tell you, believe it. Here's the final one I want to give you. I'll always live in fear. I'll always live in fear. Here's the truth. The peace of God lives on the inside of me. He holds my future because of Christ. I am not anxious about anything. He is with me wherever I go. I'm gonna write this down. I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna confess it until I start to believe it. What are the strongholds in your life, these lies that Satan has created and have created a cross of wiring? You gotta identify it. And once we identify it, we're going to speak it. We're going to find the truth. We're going to claim this. We're going we're to think about it. We're going to confess it until we believe it. You know, Paul had to do the same thing. Paul was 
blinded by Jesus and it exposed the lie of Satan and Jesus brought the truth that Paul needed. In Acts 26, Paul was telling King Agrippa about this conversion experience, about this blinding experience. And I want you to see, we, we know that Jesus revealed the lie, but, but in this account, he actually gives the truth as well. It's in Acts 26, starting in verse 15. Then I asked, <laughs> I just love this. He's telling the king this. <laughs> there I was, you know. Then I asked, where are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. Here's the truth. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a, pl a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He's given a mandate. He's given a commission. He's saying, you thought your mission was this. You were being used by Satan. I am telling you right now, that's a lie. And here's the truth. Here's the plan and purpose for your life. So for Paul, let me just take a wild guess here. Here is the lie that he was believing. Honor God by destroying the Christian church. But then Jesus shows up and gave him the truth. Here's what I believe his truth would have been. The church cannot be destroyed. Jesus is the son of God. He came to save the world from their sin. He is God in the flesh. I will live the rest of my life serving him. We're gonna identify the truth. We're gonna write the truth down. We're gonna think about the truth. We're gonna confess the truth until we believe that it is true. So we identify the lie that's holding us back. We identify the truth that can push us forward. And here's the final thing as we wrap up. We're going to allow transformation to take place. I want to remind you of our theme verse today, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know that God wants to transform you today? There is a transformation process the Lord wants you to embark upon. He wants to transform you into the person he created you to be. You see, the old way of thinking, the old thoughts, the old sin habits, the old you, he wants to transform the old into the new. He wants to make you a new creation in Christ Jesus, a new way of thinking, a new way of living. Now, for so many of you, that probably sounds so good and probably a little bit too good to be true. You might be thinking, only if there's a way that I could be freed from this toxic way of thinking. Only if there's a way that my mindset could be set free. Only if there's a way to think healthy thoughts. For Paul, Jesus exposed the lie and revealed the truth, and he was transformed in the process. We know this because of the account of his life. He went on to spread the gospel of Jesus. He went on to train and raise up people to do the same. He went on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. God used this man to influence the movement of the church. There was an obvious transformation in the life of Paul. But I want to show you where I think the transformation really took place. So Jesus came to Paul, exposed the lie, gave him his truth, and then right after that, the transformation took place. I want to show it to you. It's Acts 9, 17 through 20. Then Ananias, a man who was sent by God, watch this, went to the house and entered it, placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell off Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized at once. Now he's transformed at once. He began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. After Jesus had blinded him, Jesus exposed him to the lie of Satan. He revealed the truth to him. Then he sent a man to lay hands on him, to fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit so that he, he would be transformed. I know for me, 
I've been lied to by the enemy at times in my life. Before we started this church, the enemy began to lie to me and build very large, powerful strongholds in my mind. We left our former church and began to step in the direction of starting this church and plant this church, and then the enemy began to lie to me. It's funny how the enemy didn't lie to me before about the church, but once I stepped out, the lies began to come. He began to lie to me and say, you're all alone. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to start a church. You're too young. You're too inexperienced. No one will listen. No one will come. No one will be there to support you. No one will have your back and cover you. It makes me wonder about Peter. When Peter stepped out of the boat, I don't think he had the thoughts and the fears and the lies flood his mind until he stepped out of the boat. I think all the lies that come, they come when you choose to step out in faith. So if you're in a moment today where you're at this crossroads, you're gonna step out in faith, get ready for the enemy to begin to lie to you. Because he's not lying yet, but as soon as you step out, the lies will come. I began to believe the lies and thought to myself, well, maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe we will fail. Austin's one of the hardest, church, hard, hardest cities to plant a church in statistically. Maybe we don't have what it takes. But then two men of God came into my life and changed everything. Pastor Jess and Pastor Steve, pastor of their own churches, came in. They're on our elder team now. And they prophesied over me. And they declared to me what God has planned for my life and for this church. I honestly think he, he prophesied it into existence in that moment. <laughs> they took me before their elders and their elders surrounded us, laid hands on us, began to pray for us, speak destiny, purpose, blessing over Zayo Church. And I believe that's when it all started. Because in, in the hearing of truth, the lies lost their power. I started to believe the truth again. I needed someone to declare that in my life and speak it over me so I could believe it. I believe that God had a plan for our life and a plan for Zao Church in this region. But then something even more powerfully happened that changed everything in my opinion. They, they came to me one day. Okay, I've been in ministry since I was 16, been pastoring since I was 21. And they came to me and said, Jared, has anyone ever laid hands on you, prayed for you, commissioned you to preach the gospel, ordained you as a pastor? And in all my years of ministry, no one's ever done that. And so what they did was they brought us before their church. This is right before Zao started. Brought Allie and I up on stage. Their team of elders, 20, 30 people got behind us. The church was all right here, extending their hands. They laid hands on us and they blessed us. They ordained us. They commissioned us to preach the gospel and set us in as pastors of Zao Church before there was a Zao Church. That was the day everything changed. And I, like Paul, as I was being prayed over, I just believe and saw the scales falling off my eyes. The enemy has no power over me when I know the truth because he has given us the truth and the truth is free. Your life is headed in the direction of your strongest thoughts. You owe it to yourself to identify the lies that Satan is feeding you and replace it with the truth of God. Once we've identified it, we're going to write it down. We're going to think about it. We're going to confess it until we believe it. And once we do that, we're going to let others pray for us. We're going to allow transformation to take place and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us to the point where scales will come off our eyes. You're in a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't 
in any good conscience stand here as a pastor and ignore that scripture. Jesus thought fitting enough to send someone to lay hands on a man and pray that he might be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he was baptized. That'll mess your theology up. This is how you get your mind right. And live the life that God has always intended for you to live. I want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads where you're at? Now, I don't have a lot of me in here, so I'm just going to, I'm going to extend my hands and I'm going to pray for you just as if I was standing over your shoulders laying hands on you. And I want to pray the power of God to come forth in your life. I want to pray an infilling of the Holy Spirit over your life. I'm going to pray that these scales would fall and you would see the truth. So Holy Spirit, right now, I just ask for an infilling, an overfilling of the Holy Spirit right now in this moment to those who are in the room. Father, I just see you filling each and every person in this room with your Holy Spirit. Father, enable us to see your truth. Expose the lies that we've been believing. And Lord, in this moment, I just pray that scales would begin to fall. That the lies, the habits, the old way of thinking would go and the new way would come. You would create new pathways, new thought lives, new habits. So Father, right now, I'm just asking for the Holy Spirit to come to fill and empower us, to lead us to your truth, and that will be changed from the inside out. And I want to close like I always do. I just want to pray for those who have never made a decision to follow Jesus. Tara kicked us off and just asked if you've never believed in Jesus, that the Lord would begin to soften your heart, that Maybe you haven't been living for Jesus. Maybe you find something missing in your life. Well, today I want to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your heart. We had a funeral here yesterday, and I, 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 I prayed this salvation prayer, and I know several prayed it, but I'm just asking that that would fall over today, that maybe you've never trusted in Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity today, right where you're at, begin a renewed relationship with him. Just right where you're at, just say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe in you today. Thank you for dying on the cross in my place for my sins. And today, I start a new life with you. Transform me. Change me from the inside out. Make me into the kind of person you want me to be. And I commit to living for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we clap and celebrate those who prayed that prayer? I'm so glad you guys came to Zayo today, and I hope you see that we're not into playing church as usual. We believe that it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the power of God that can change a city. And I know that you guys are going through things, so thank you for allowing us to pray that you be filled with the Holy Spirit today. I'm just praying that this changes you and marks you today. Amen.